Welcome to lecture 55 of this series. This series of lecture is on fluids and electrolytes. It is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common and Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. Please subscribe to this channel, and you can also find the book on Amazon. We are still on Chapter 8, Metabolic Acidosis. Today we are going to start our discussion of pathophysiology of metabolic acidosis. Like we said before, metabolic acidosis is a reduction in blood pH due to primary reduction in serum bicarbonate. Therefore, we have an associated compensatory decrease, reduction in carbon dioxide arterial pressure. Let's talk about renal net acid excretion. The kidneys play a vital function in acid-base regulation. So for renal net acid excretion, we have three components. Number one, and the most important by far, is ammonium and H4 plus production. Second in importance is titratable acidity. And number three is urinary bicarb. So the net acid excretion is the action of titratable acidity plus ammonium excretion minus bicarb, meaning we have to reabsorb all the bicarbonate. Otherwise, if you lose bicarbonate, you are going to have more acidosis. Under normal conditions, all of the bicarbonate filters through the glomeruli is reabsorbed. Unless you have a problem like proximal tubular acidosis, you should reabsorb all of the filtered bicarbonate. Now, new bicarbonate is generated by the kidneys to replace the bicarbonate that is utilized as a buffer. We talked about that. Now, the proximal tubule is going to reabsorb 80% of filtered bicarb. The thick ascending limb will absorb another 15%. The remainder 5% is reabsorbed by the cortical collecting duct and the inner medullary collecting duct. Long story short, all of the filtered bicarb should be reabsorbed. The most important titratable acid is phosphate. Its pKa is 6.8. Creatinine and uric acid play a lesser role as a titratable acid. In chronic metabolic acidosis, keep in mind that titratable acids do not increase significantly. Ammonium, on the other hand, is the most important thing. Ammonium excretion increases, but that takes a while, four to seven days to happen. Now, let's talk about the ammonium cycle. Okay, the ammonia-ammonium system in H3 and H4 plus is the critical component of net acid excretion. I cannot emphasize that enough. The most important thing is ammonium excretion. So where does ammonium come from? It comes from the proximal tubule. Glutamine, which is an amino acid, each ion will give you two ammonium and two bicarb. Okay, so now we have bicarb and ammonium inside the cell. What's going to happen? The sodium hydrogen exchanger, or antiporter, is located on the epical membrane of the proximal tubule. It's going to transport that ammonium into the lumen. So now the ammonium has exited the proximal tubular cell, and now it's in the lumen. Now, the thick ascending limb will reabsorb it. So now it was out, now it's back in paracellularly, passively, via the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter, and to a certain extent by the apical potassium channel. Then, now it's inside the thick ascending limb cells. The final step is going to diffuse non-ionically, is going to be secreted into the lumen of the collecting duct. So it's like it's in and then out and then in again and then finally out into the lumen of the collecting duct. So this is how we get ammonium into the collecting duct. Now, chronic acidosis and hypokalemia increase ammonium synthesis, while hyperkalemia decrease ammonium synthesis. This is why patients with hypokalemia, especially if it's due to hyperaldosteronism, usually they have metabolic alkalosis because their ammonia synthesis is going to increase, okay, so they're going to have alkalosis. Now, people with acidosis, especially, for example, type 4 renal tubular acidosis, they have hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis because they don't make enough ammonium, okay, their ammonium synthesis is decreased because of the hyperkalemia, they cannot excrete enough hydrogen, and therefore they have acidosis. The way I remember it, when potassium is up, 
pH is down, meaning acidosis. When potassium is down, pH is up, is usually alkalosis. So hypokalemia goes with alkalosis. Hyperkalemia usually goes with acidosis. Now, let's uh, talk about ammonium production in the proximal tubule. Let's look at this figure. I just mentioned that. So we have an amino acid. Glutamine is going to give us two ammonium, two in H4 and two bicarb. Okay, the bicarb is going to, to exit the cell, but the ammonium is going to use the hydrogen sodium antiporter and exit the cell. Okay, so this is the first step in ammonium exit. It's formed in the proximal tubule, it's going to exit the lumen via the hydrogen sodium antiporter. Let's talk about that step by step. So most of that bicarb in the proximal tubule is going to be reabsorbed. Okay. So how does the body reabsorb the filtered bicarbonate? I just said that 80% of filtered bicarbonate is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, 15% in the thick ascending limb, the remainder 5% in the collecting tubule. Okay. So the body is going to filter all that bicarb. How does it go back in? Okay, now here we have a rule. When you get rid of hydrogen, you gain bicarbonate and vice versa. So the way to reabsorb the bicarbonate is via secreting hydrogen. So how does that work? It's, it's really fascinating. So now we have bicarbonate in the lumen. I'm going to send a messenger. I'm going to send hydrogen to come to go and get it. The hydrogen is going to use the sodium hydrogen exchanger or antiporter. We call it antiporter because when hydrogen goes out, sodium goes in. So when you have a positive charge going out, another positive charge will go in. So hydrogen will go out, sodium will go back in. Okay. So now the hydrogen is going to exit the proximal tubular cell, sodium will go in. Okay, the hydrogen ATPase pump plays a role, but, but uh, less role. Okay, so now the hydrogen is in the lumen and is going to meet what? The bicarb, because the bicarb in, in, is in the lumen. Here, they're going to join and form H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid is going to turn into CO2 and H2O via carbonic anhydrase type 4. So we have two types of carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Four, which is in the lumen, and, uh, uh, and two, which is in the cytosol, which is inside the cell of the proximal tubule. So now uh, notice what happened. We turned the bicarb into CO2 and water. Now water can diffuse freely and CO2 can diffuse freely. Now the CO2 now can go back into the cells and the water will go into the cells here the carbonic anhydrase 2, which exists inside the cell, is going to form carbonic acid again, but here we are going to get back both. We are going to get back our hydrogen, the hydrogen will go back out to get another bicarb, and the bicarb now can exit the cell via the sodium bicarbonate transporter. So, so this, is, this is really very neat. So the bicarb is in, in the lumen. I'm going to send the hydrogen. The hydrogen will bind it. Now we have water and CO2. They diffuse in and then they become hydrogen and bicarb again. The hydrogen will go out to reclaim another bicarb. The bicarb will find its way out of the proximal tubule cell into the blood via the sodium bicarbonate transporter, which has many names. Uh, NBCL, NBCE1. I put all these names on the screens. In red here, I put hydrogen secretion leads to bicarbonate generation in the cells. So when you lose hydrogen, you are going to gain bicarb. When you gain bicarb, you are going to lose hydrogen. They're exactly the same. Why? Because we have this great fascinating system of carbonic anhydrase. By the way, carbonic anhydrase is probably one of the most, if not the most efficient enzyme in the body. The speed it works, it's, it's amazing. So in order for this process to happen, you have to keep the inside of the cell negative. And here we have our old friend, the sodium potassium ATPase pump. If you want to know one pump in the body, it's the sodium potassium ATPase. It's not just in, in humans, it's 
pretty much in every cell. And this pump will keep the cell negative by keeping sodium lower on the inside of the cell, higher on, on the outside. And this is you mean maintain negativity. And this is how all these pumps will work. Okay. This way you're encouraging the bicarb to go in and then go out. You're encouraging the hydrogen to go out, etc. Now here, um, again, uh, re illustration. So, uh, if, if you look uh, outside the cell, you have the hydrogen plus the bicarb. We are going to have carbonic anhydrase 4, um, and then the, the carbonic acid is going to become CO2 and water. CO2 and water will easily diffuse back into the cells, and here is these are going to be welcomed by carbonic anhydrase 2, which is inside the cell. We are going to have carbonic acid again, and then we are going to reclaim the hydrogen. The hydrogen will go out to reclaim another bicarb. Notice that it's going to go out via the sodium hydrogen antiporter. So hydrogen is out, sodium is back in, and then the sodium and the bicarb are going to exit the cell via the sodium bicarbonate pump. And you see here the uh, most important pump, the sodium potassium ATPase pump, working hard to keep the cell negative. In the uh, next lecture, we are going to uh, finish our discussion of metabolic acidosis pathophysiology. See you then.